Good day everyone and welcome to the second part of our discussion on convection. In this video, we will be discussing natural convection and systems with phase change. So let's begin. Natural or free convection is a type of heat transfer wherein buoyancy forces are much more important than fluid velocity. To put that into simple terms, in natural convection, we are not interested in the velocity of the fluid transferring the heat. That's because the velocities involved in natural convection are negligibly small compared to those in forced convection. Okay? In natural convection, what's more important is the resulting movement of the fluid due to temperature changes between a body and a fluid. Natural convection is best illustrated in this example. We have here a hot egg that is sitting in a surface and the direction of the movement of air around the egg is shown here. So we all know that warm air gets less dense such that it floats in a pool of cold air. That is the basic principle of natural convection. The buoyancy forces that are a result of the difference in densities of hot and cold packets of fluid is what results to what we call natural convection currents. Okay? So warm air tends to rise because they are less dense and cold air tends to sink because it's denser than warm air. If you will recall back on our discussion on forced convection, the rate of heat transfer due to forced convection is directly proportional to the velocity of the fluid raised to a positive integer. In contrast, for natural convection, the rate of heat transfer due to natural convection is directly proportional to the difference in temperature between the surface and the free stream temperature of the fluid raised to a positive integer n. That means that if you have a bigger difference in temperature between the solid surface and the fluid, that would result to a larger amount of heat transferred via natural convection. Since this is still convection, even though it's now natural convection, the governing heat equation is still the same. It's still Q, or the rate of heat transfer, is equal to HA times delta T. H still being the heat transfer coefficient by convection, okay? But now we will be having different equations to estimate the value of the heat transfer coefficient. Let's start with the Nusselt number correlations for free convection. If you go back to our discussion on forced convection, you would see that most of the available correlations are for fluid flow inside of a conduit. For natural convection, normally these correlations will be for the outside surface of some conduit. Let's start with vertical plates. For vertical plates, both laminar and turbulence, we have this equation here. You would see that it's the Nusselt number as a function of the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. The Nusselt number for natural convection is no longer dependent on the Reynolds number. If you will recall, the Reynolds number is a function of the fluid velocity, and fluid velocity is not important in natural convection. Instead, we have the Rayleigh number, which showcases the buoyancy forces in the fluid. The Rayleigh number is simply a product of the Grassoff number and the Prandtl number. Okay? We define the Grassoff number as the collection of the following variables. We have beta g rho squared L cubed delta t over mu squared. Rho is the fluid density. L is the geometry or the characteristic length of the surface being studied. Mu is still the viscosity of the fluid. Delta T is the driving force to the heat transfer. This is the surface temperature minus the free stream temperature of the fluid. G is still the acceleration due to gravity. That's 9.81 meters per second squared. And beta is the compressibility factor of the fluid. For gases, the beta is simply the reciprocal of the absolute temperature, while for liquids, we have to estimate the value from our handbook. Now, our Nusselt number correlations for natural convection normally prefer to use the Rayleigh number over the Grassoff number. So let's derive the equation for the Rayleigh number. The Rayleigh number is simply the product between the Grassoff number and the Prandtl number. So we write for the Grassoff number, that is beta g rho squared L cube delta t over mu squared, and then Prandtl number is still Cp mu over K. Simplifying, we have Rayleigh number is equal to beta G rho squared L cube delta T times Cp over mu times K. This is now our expression for the Rayleigh number. That means that for natural convection, we have to look for the density, viscosity, thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and compressibility of the fluid in question. Okay, this is in conjunction for us determining the Prandtl number for the fluid. So let's go back to the correlation. Once you have the Rayleigh number for the fluid and the Prandtl number, you can simply substitute those in this equation to determine the Nusselt number. 
the Nusselt number is still defined as HL over K or HD over K depending on the geometry. In this instance, you will notice that the subscript of the Nusselt number is L, meaning that we have to use the formula HL over K, L pertaining to the length of the vertical plate. This equation caters to both laminar and turbulent flow, but for more accurate expression for laminar flow, in natural convection, we characterize laminar flow as a Rayleigh number that is less than 10 raised to 9. You may use this equation. Next, for vertical cylinders, if the diameter over length ratio is greater than or equal to 35 over the Grassoff number raised to 1 fourth, then the cylinder can be treated as a vertical wall. And if the diameter over length ratio passes this test, then you may use these two equations for the Nusselt number even though the system is a vertical cylinder. Okay? All fluid properties are evaluated at the film temperature. To review, the film temperature is the average between the bulk temperature of the fluid and the surface temperature of the solid. For horizontal plates with hot surfaces facing upward or cold surfaces facing downward, we have this expression for the Nusselt number. Now we have two equations here, and that would depend on the value of the Rayleigh number. If the Rayleigh number is between 10 raised to 4 and 10 raised to 7, we use 0 0.54 times Rayleigh number raised to 1 fourth. And if it's between 10 raised to 7 and 10 raised to 10, we use the equation 0 0.15 times Rayleigh number raised to 1 third. For the opposite, for horizontal plates with hot surfaces facing downward or cold surfaces facing upward, provided that the Rayleigh number is within this range, between 10 raised to 5 and 10 raised to 10, you may use this expression for the Nusselt number, 0 0.27 times Rayleigh number raised to 1 fourth. And for horizontal cylinders, we have this expression, the Nusselt number again as a function of the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. So you see from these equations that the orientation of the system that would be either vertical or horizontal has a very big effect on the rate of heat transfer because they have different expressions for the Nusselt number on both systems. A classic example of this is when you have a canned beverage, let's say for example soft drinks in a can and you want to cool it in a refrigerator, would you want that cylinder to remain upright or would you want that cylinder to be lying down in a horizontal position? The position of the beverage would have a lot to do with its rate of heat transfer. If it's oriented in a certain way, then it will cool faster. We will be solving for that in a separate video. We also have Nusselt number correlations for spheres. In this case, the Prandtl number should be around 1, and the Rayleigh number must be between 1 and 10 raised to 5. And we can use this expression for the Nusselt number. As a side note, as Rayleigh number approaches 0, or if the value is less than 1, Conduction dominates natural convection. That means that our solution could simply just be of conduction. Let's try to solve this example. A fluorescent light bulb rated at 100 watts is illuminated in air at 25 degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressure. Under these conditions, the surface temperature of the glass is 140 degrees Celsius. Determine the rate of heat transfer from the bulb by natural convection. The bulb is cylindrical having a diameter of 35 millimeters and a length of 0.8 meters and is oriented horizontally. Here are our given for the problem. So we have a horizontally oriented cylinder with a surface temperature of 140 degrees Celsius and the surrounding air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So first and foremost, we need to establish what is our fluid. In this case, our fluid is air and air will be the medium of our natural convective heat transfer. So with that, all of the physical properties that we have to determine are all for air. The next thing that we have to establish is what temperature do we evaluate the physical properties of air? As I have mentioned earlier, for natural convection, we mostly determine the properties at the film temperature. In this case, the film temperature will be the average between the surface temperature, 140 degrees Celsius, and the bulk temperature of air, 25 degrees Celsius. So we write the film temperature of air as 140 plus 25 over and that is 82.5 degrees Celsius, or converting to Kelvin, we have 355.65 Kelvin. Before we proceed to determining the Rayleigh and the Prandtl number, let's first look for the physical properties of air, that's density, viscosity, thermal conductivity, and heat capacity. 
Let's start with the density of air. Now, the density of gaseous substances are not included in our handbook, and we have to assume that they are behaving as ideal gases in order for us to use the ideal gas equation in determining the density of the fluid. So for ideal gases, we write that the density is equal to Pm over Rt, wherein P is the pressure, M is the molecular weights of the gas, R is the real gas constant, and T is the absolute temperature. Our pressure is one atmosphere, so let's solve. We have 101.325 pascals times molecular weight of air is 0 0.029, that is kilograms per mole. R is 8.314 uh, pascal cubic meter per mole per Kelvin times the absolute temperature, that's the film temperature, 355.65 Kelvin. Our density, 0 0.994 kilograms per cubic meter. Next, viscosity. Using the equations in our handbook, we find that the viscosity of air at this temperature is 2.11 times 10 raised to negative 5 pascal seconds. I will leave this up to you to verify. Next parameter, heat capacity. The heat capacity of air is a little bit tricky to solve coming from our handbook because it is given as a function of hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. So if you can devise an Excel spreadsheet program that will give you the physical properties of fluids if you enter the absolute temperature will be very helpful to you, okay? For air at the film temperature, the heat capacity is 1,004 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Lastly, at our film temperature, the thermal conductivity of air is 0 0.3 watts per meter per Kelvin. Now we are ready to solve for the Prandtl number and the Rayleigh number. Let's first solve for the Prandtl number. Prandtl number is Cp mu over K, that is 1004 times 2.11 times 10 raised to negative 5 divided by the thermal conductivity 0 0.03. Our Prandtl number is 0 0.706. Next, we solve for the Rayleigh number. The Rayleigh number, remember, is the product of the Grassoff number and the Prandtl number. We write the Grassoff number. We write this as beta rho squared L cube delta T times G all over mu squared times the Prandtl number. And remember that beta or compressibility for gases, for ideal gases specifically, is simply the inverse of the absolute temperature. That is 1 over... 355.65 Kelvin. If we solve for the Rayleigh number, we now have beta or 1 over 355.65 Kelvin times density squared 0.994 squared times the cube of the characteristic length times delta T. Delta T is simply the temperature difference, that is the surface temperature minus the bulk temperature of the fluid, that is 140 minus 25 degrees Celsius. No need to convert to Kelvins because the conversion factors will just cancel. And finally, multiply that with G or 9.81 meters per second per second, divided by viscosity squared, that is 2.11 times 10 raised to negative 5 squared. Basically, the first factor in our equation is the Grassoff number. So we simply multiply that with the Prandtl number, 0 0.706, to get the Rayleigh number. Our Rayleigh number is given here as 2.54 times 10 raised to 9. Now that we have the Prandtl number and the Rayleigh number, we can now substitute them in our Nusselt number correlation to determine our heat transfer coefficient. So if we go back to our Nusselt number correlations, for horizontal cylinders, you can use this expression of the Nusselt number, okay? Substituting, our Nusselt number is 155.3. Now, from this Nusselt number, we can now solve for the heat transfer coefficient. Remember that the Nusselt number is equal to HL over K. Solving for H, we have Nusselt number multiplied by the thermal conductivity, 0 0.03, divided by the characteristic length, 0 0.8 meters. Our heat transfer coefficient is 5.82 watts per square meter per Kelvin. 
Now, if you will compare this value of the heat transfer coefficient by natural convection to those coming from forced convection, of course, in this case, the heat transfer coefficient is lower, okay? In general, heat transfer coefficients are higher for forced convection compared to natural convection. Now that we have our heat transfer coefficients, we can now answer the question, which is asking for the rate of heat transfer from the fluorescent tube to the air. Again, our governing equation is Q is equal to HA delta T. Our area in this case pertains to the lateral surface area of the cylinder where heat is being transferred. And delta T is the temperature difference that is surface temperature minus bulk fluid temperature. We substitute heat transfer coefficient 5.82 times our surface area in this case is pi dl. So that is pi times diameter of 0 0.035 meters times length of 0.8 meters times the driving force that is 140 minus 25. Our rate of heat transfer Q is equal to 58.91 watts. That is our process in solving natural convection problems. The core of our strategy lies in first getting all of the physical properties of the fluid involved and then solving for the Prandtl and the Rayleigh number and then looking for a suitable Nusselt number correlations to which we get the Nusselt number, the heat transfer coefficient, and finally the rate of heat transfer. Okay? So our method of solving problems involving convection, whether that be forced convection or natural convection, is reliant on the same flow of our solution. The only difference is that in forced convection, we use the Reynolds number, and for natural convection, we use the Rayleigh number. Let's proceed. Let's now discuss heat transfer with phase change. Now, for this part of the lesson, we will not be performing any calculations, but it is important for you to acknowledge that heat transfer with phase change is very important in the industry because it lends itself in many aspects of the processes in industry, such as boiling and condensation. Industrial applications of heat transfer often involve systems wherein there is a change in phase, like evaporation and condensation. Thus, it is important to know how to determine heat transfer coefficients with phase change. Although the equations for determining heat transfer coefficients with phase change are given in our handbook, we will not be solving actual problems. Okay? We will just be looking at the mechanisms of how condensation and evaporation are able to obtain very high values of heat transfer coefficients. Let's start with condensation. Condensation happens in heat exchangers where the heating fluid is a saturated vapor that transfers its latent heat to the other fluid. So basically, as a vapor condenses, the latent heat involved in that process can be transferred. We have here two mechanisms of condensation. The first we call film condensation. And the second we call dropwise condensation. The main difference is listed on this figure here. Film condensation states that there is a uniform thin film of liquid that forms around a solid surface during condensation. That is pictured on letter A here. The circle is the cross-section of a solid pipe, and the condensed fluid around it is represented in gray. You can see that it forms a uniform thin film of fluid around this tube, and then that film would then descend via gravity by laminar flow. Okay? Shown in letter B is another view of that phenomena. You can see that there is a uniform film of fluid all over the cylinder. And if you are applying this in a heat exchanger, as you can see in letter C, the thin film of fluid, as it is influenced by gravity, will be flowing towards the lower tubes. Okay? In contrast, we have the dropwise condensation. Dropwise condensation is illustrated to this figure to the right. You see that several droplets of varying sizes are forming on a surface. That means that the entire surface is not covered with fluid at all times. And what's interesting here is during dropwise condensation, as your droplets merge and form bigger and bigger droplets, those bigger droplets will be overcome by gravity and then they will fall. 
And as the large droplets fall, they will be bringing other smaller droplets that are below the bigger droplet. So what happens is, as the bigger droplets fall, you are exposing new area of the solid boundary for further condensation to happen. That's why it's not surprising that dropwise condensation gives you a higher heat transfer coefficient compared to film condensation. In film condensation, the thin film of liquid that forms around your tube actually presents a greater resistance to condensation due to conduction within the thin film, okay? While in dropwise condensation, as the larger droplets are removed, we are exposing new surfaces from which we can further condense the vapor. That's why dropwise condensation is preferred. Next, let's take a look at boiling. So for boiling, we can characterize the heat transfer coefficients based on the regime where it falls. For boiling, we have six different regimes as illustrated in this table from 1 to 6. And the characteristics of each regime is dependent on the difference between the surface temperature and the saturation temperature of your fluid. So to make this easier to visualize, let's take boiling water on a pot as an example. Since we are boiling water at atmospheric pressure, the saturation temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, that is the boiling point of water at atmospheric pressure, and the surface temperature will be the temperature of the bottom of the pan that is exposed to the heat, okay? Under the first regime, you can see that what dominates is free convection. In the early stages of boiling water in a pan, you can notice this regime as the water forming convection currents which are visible to the naked eye. Those convection currents are visible because at the start of the boiling, the water at the top of the pot is the coldest and the water at the bottom of the pot is the hottest because it is the one exposed to the heat source. And the warmer water from the bottom rises to the top and it replaces the cold water at the top. So this continuous cycle is what heats the water. But as you can see here, the ratio of the heat transfer with respect to area is relatively low for the free convection range. That's because as we have established earlier, free convection is slower than forced convection. Okay? As you increase this temperature difference, we enter the second regime in which nucleate boiling bubbles now appear. In our example, you would observe this as our water gets warmer and warmer. You would see that bubbles are forming at the bottom of your pot. Those bubbles are actually pockets of water vapor that are still adhering to the bottom of the pan. Now, if you have a rough surface, those bubbles would continue to cling at the bottom of the pan, while if you have a smooth surface, those bubbles would then release once they reach a critical size. Okay? At this regime, you would also observe that some of the smaller bubbles are joining together to form larger bubbles. And what's interesting here is that larger bubbles are more prone to rising to the surface. Now you can see here that the rate of heat transfer is higher than that of the free convection, but is still slower than the rest of the other regimes. That's because the bubbles that are forming at the bottom of your pan are actually additional resistances to heat transfer. Inside of those bubbles, the heat transfer is mainly due to conduction, and that is much more slower than convection, okay? So the bubbles are actually offering another resistance to heat transfer. But as those bubbles become bigger and bigger and they rise to the surface, then we enter the next regime. We are now on regime 3, wherein the nucleate boiling bubbles rise to the surface. This time, as the bubbles are being released from the bottom of the pan, you are actually decreasing the resistance to heat transfer. As you decrease your resistance to heat transfer due to the release of those bubbles, what happens is your rate of heat transfer drastically increases up to a critical point. From there, we enter regime 4, which is the partial nucleate boiling and unstable film. What happens here is as you further increase your surface temperature, the rate of the formation of nucleate bubbles at the bottom of the vessel is so fast that they immediately form to join larger and larger bubbles which are not immediately released to the surface. So what happens is we are now forming a film of water vapor at the very bottom of our vessel. And that results to a decrease in the rate of heat transfer because again, as I have mentioned, in that film of water vapor, heat is being transferred by conduction. Okay, as you further increase the surface temperature, we enter regime 5, which is the stable film boiling. We do not want stable film boiling to happen because, again, it hampers the fast transfer of heat from the bottom of the pan to the bulk of the fluid. An interesting phenomena that you can further research regarding this stable film boiling is what we call the Leiden frost effect. That's a little bit different, but the concept is the same. You are heating something so fast that you are forming a film of vapor that actually insulates the rest of your fluid. 
Okay? So if you have some free time, kindly look for the Leiden frost effect. And finally, as we further increase the difference in the temperature, we now enter the final regime in which radiation is now coming to play. If you take a look at the curve, the rate of heat transfer is now linearly increasing with respect to the increase in surface temperature. However, this now occurs at a temperature of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit greater than that of the saturation temperature of the fluid. And for some instances, this is very impractical to pull off. So for practical purposes, we would want to keep this boiling curve at this maximum point here in between regime 3 and regime 4 wherein we have nucleate boiling that immediately releases the bubbles formed at the bottom surface. By keeping the temperature difference within this range, we are ensuring that we are getting the maximum rate of heat transfer in our boiling. To summarize, going back to condensation, we have two types, film condensation and dropwise condensation. We want dropwise condensation because it gives us a higher heat transfer coefficient. For boiling, we have several regimes, but what we want the most is nucleate boiling in which the bubbles immediately rise to the surface such as to not impede the rate of heat transfer. Okay, that's it for this lesson. Please watch out for separate videos that will detail solutions to more natural convection problems. Okay, I hope you have learned something. Thank you for listening and as always, keep safe. Thank you.